Dream Team? Really? <laughs> All right, let's start the conference off on a slightly creepy note. Uh, I love the good morning thing. I expected the Pledge of Allegiance to follow. That was awesome. Uh, so you'll notice there's two podiums here. This is because we will be giving a presentation followed by a debate. <laughs> we are calling this talk You and I. It would be nice to think that this had deep uh, revelations and implications about users and interfaces or users and interaction. Um, instead, it means that we had no idea three months ago what we were going to talk about. We figured it'd probably be something in the UI space. Um, turns out we were right. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, our obsessions. Um, we have two parts to the talk. There's the chat talk part, and then there's the romance part. And they are remarkably dissimilar, because we developed them completely separately. We had no idea what the other one was doing and didn't actually care. Um, so he's sort of split it in the middle. If I go past the halfway point, he'll probably hit me and take over at that point. Um, so why don't we start? Did you want to introduce yourself? Uh, start. OK. <laughs> All right, thanks. I mean, start by introducing yourself. Oh, hi, I'm Ramad Guy. No, you're not. OK. I'm Chad Haas. Uh, I work on the Android UI Toolkit team. Uh, I used to write a lot of code about graphics and animation and performance. Uh, and right now, instead, I manage that team and go to a lot of meetings. Uh, and I'm Roman Guy. I now manage the Android graphics team. So I don't write code anymore, and I go to a lot of meetings. <laughs> it's the sad progression of tech careers, isn't it? Which is why you won't see much code in our slides. <laughs> A little bit, a little bit. Uh, OK, so I'm going to talk for a while, and then Roman's going to talk. That's going to, do you want me to go over the agenda again? Everybody got the details? You got notes on that? All right. First, let's talk about animation rules. So um, there's a book by Disney called uh, The Illusion of Life. I would recommend that you read it. In particular, there's a chapter in there called The Principles of Animation, The 12 Rules of Animation. I forget. It's been a while. Um, it's a huge book. It's a coffee table book about the size of a coffee table. Uh, it's, it's a really good description of the rules and principles that Disney applied to animations um, when they created all their, their movies and shorts uh, years and years and years ago. And a lot of those principles apply today um, across animations, but also across life and also across user interfaces. Um, we've actually talked about this before. In uh, Google I.O. in 2013, uh, we had a talk, I can't remember the name of it, where we talked about a lot of animation principles, including cartoon animation principles. Lots of demos there. Um, go check that out. Uh, if you've already seen that one, um, you might not know that we also gave that talk uh, four years before that at DevOx. Um, so that's on parlays.com. We went over all the 12 rules. So we're not going to regurgitate all of that stuff. But instead, today, uh, I wanted to focus on the principles that really apply directly to stuff that you can see on the Android platform in which you should apply to your animations when you're creating them or using them on the system. Some of the rules, since they were created for hand-drawn animations, don't apply as easily. And I'll go over sort of the, the bulk of those rules at the end and just sort of cover the, the ideas behind them. Um, but I did want to spend some time on the ones that you can actually see in the platform, especially since material design and especially since uh, the animation capabilities in the platform have made a lot of this stuff a lot easier than it used to be a few years ago. So let's start out with um, staging, which is sort of at the heart of a lot of the principles here, where the idea is to connect um, the user or the viewer to the action that you want them to understand uh, happening on the screen at the time. And you see this in animations, obviously, because that's what we're talking about. You also see it in movies a lot. If you'll notice, in a lot of movies, you have a character that wears distinctive clothing so that when they show a crowd shot, you know that the guy in the green hat is the main character, and you're supposed to follow their actions. So there may be 300 extras on the screen, but you know where the main character is. I think they also do this so that when there's a stunt double, they can fool you into thinking that's actually the actor. But there are reasons to keep your eye focused on that person, because there's so much going on that if you're just presented with the chaos of a city scene, you're not really going to know what it is you're supposed to pay attention to and, and glean from that scene. So they give you um, hints. They'll you know, focus on that character and zoom out. Uh, they'll do other things to make sure that you understand what you're supposed to be watching on the screen. Same thing in animation, where you have a very short amount of time to get the information that they want to impart. This character is going to run over there. This character is doing something secretive in the corner of the room. They want to draw your attention to that character so that you get what you need to out of that scene so that you understand the follow-on actions that are going to happen in the cartoon. So um, simple diagram here. We have a lot of objects on the screen there. There's this massive scene with a bunch of stuff. And then somewhere uh, in that scene is going to be an object that will draw your attention. 
with animation, with color, with something that distinguishes itself from everything around it. So I wanted to show a couple of examples that you can see uh, on the Android platform so you get a little better sense of how this is integrated into some uh, applications today. Um, the first one is from Play Music. Um, the animation, it's a bit janky. Uh, it's actually because of screen record, so don't, don't blame Play Music. Um, Play Music was one of the first apps to do a lot of activity transitions. They worked really hard to integrate the idea of launching from one activity um, to the other with shared elements because they really have this, this um, immersive experience in which you are uh, dealing with the same media over and over again. You're going from a list of the songs on an album into descriptions of the songs or back out to a list of albums and you're always, there are these common elements in between these activities and they want to make sure to bring the user along uh, with that experience. So here uh, we see when you tap on the album, you have this ripple animation uh, and then it launches. Does it? Yes, there we go, with that little janky stutter in the middle, thank you, um, screen record. Right, so what they're doing is taking you from one activity to the other, but instead of simply erasing the screen and painting the new one in place, and then your brain has to parse the new information, they're helping you focus on the key element, which is um, the album, in particular, uh, the Genesis album, which is one of the greatest albums, uh, that will take you from one screen to the other so that you know that this is detailed information about that specific album, uh, because why would you need anything besides Genesis? or Satrion. Uh, okay, so we, we can also see this in some of the new launch animations. I don't know if people have noticed those, um, where I think these came online, is it the N preview or M? So many releases, so many things going on. So when we tap on that, uh, we can see the, the quick um, splash screen-ish. Uh, let's run that one again. So we tap on the icon and then we launch roughly from the icon with, uh, with an icon in the middle of the window background so that you know, you know this isn't just a random blank window coming onto the screen or you're not presented with you know, automatically the full UI of this app that you went into, um, but instead uh, it helps bring you there by showing you the icon along the way. Um, Android development tip, just use a drawable for your window background. Don't do some fancy screen, like new launch animation activity thing that has to be loaded on its own, like drawables for window backgrounds, they're very efficient, uh, they get the job done without a lot of overhead, so do that. Um, let's see, okay, we've run that one enough. So let's go on to the next one, slow in out. Um, so this is about uh, movement, in particular it's about timing and more natural timing for the user to understand, because the animations were about mimicking life, it's about characters that you want to uh, imbue with life so that the, the audience understands them and has some sympathy and empathy with these characters um, and not just these sort of animated things happening on the screen. It's not just a sequence of frames, it's actually characters, lifelike characters on the screen. So you want the motion to impart the feeling that these are real beings on the screen. So we have, again, a, a simple animation here. So we have this sort of non-linear thing on the top. You're easing in, you're easing out, you're accelerating into the motion then, and then you're decelerating out of it, whereas on the bottom you get this linear motion. Uh, you can, so we'll run this again a little bit faster. Um, so you can think of the one on the top as being more natural because this is how we as human beings move, right? If you have a computer, if you have a robot moving, they may be moving linearly, right? And if we see an animation on the screen, that's what we think. If it's moving linearly, it looks mechanical to us because humans living beings don't move that way. We do accelerate into motions and we decelerate out of them. Um, another way to think of it, if we see this again, we'll sort of speed this up here, um, is that the, the one on the top, essentially the takeaway from the talk is that the one on the top is, is better and the linear motion is in fact sucky. So, uh, of course, there are exceptions to this rule um, and one of them is when you're fading something, when you animate the opacity of a view, you don't necessarily need the is in and is out. You can use a linear interpolator and we'll actually discover why in the second part, part of the talk. So if I forget to talk about it, like remind me while I'm, while I'm uh, talking about colors. Um, there are other situations where you want linear motion. Uh, for instance, when you have very big ob objects on screen, sometimes they look better uh, with linear motion. So don't take that as a rule that you, know, you have to apply no matter what. Make sure to, to try it and see if it makes sense for the current animation. And interestingly, uh, the last point is that in VR, linear motion is something you actually want. So when you have a, a first person point of view in a VR environment, if you have an is in, is out motion for the camera, 
it feels pretty horrible. Like it makes me sick because you don't feel, your body doesn't feel that acceleration and deceleration. So in that situation, you do want a linear motion. Doesn't look as nice, but doesn't make you puke, which is a pretty good feature. <laughs> now in VR, less puke. Uh, so something interesting came up during the development of Lollipop where we were dealing uh, a lot with the UX team that was developing some of the animation principles behind material design. It's that they use the language of easing exactly opposite as we do. Um, I believe theirs comes from the more traditional stuff. I think if I went back and read the Disney stuff again, it would probably match their worldview, which we think of as being wrong. Uh, no, it's not wrong. It's just it's, wrong. It's just wrong. OK. <laughs> no quotes at all. Um, OK, so when we say ease in, ease out, so the, the motion that I showed with the ball moving from the left to the right, it accelerated in and it decelerated out. We call that ease in, out. It's easing into the interval, and then it's easing out of the interval. Um, this is exactly what, uh, what it's like in the, I don't know, if people dealt with the flash platform, the Penner easing equations. Um, all, it's sort of a common language in programming animations. It's been around for years with software developers. In the meantime, the designers, for some reason, haven't been paying attention to us. And they use this language to mean the opposite thing. So if they say ease in, they actually mean easing into the pose at the end of the interval. And if they say ease out, they mean easing out of the pose at the beginning. So when they say ease in, ease out, they're talking about easing out of the pose at the beginning and then easing into the one at the end. So they actually mean like decelerating out and then accelerate. And it's completely, it warps my mind every time I think about it. They're just, they're wrong. But if you ever get into a confusing conversation with your designer, you might just try pointing out to them that they're wrong. <laughs> yeah, they're sometimes confusing for other reasons. I remember having, you know, working with UX designers and they have this beautiful interpolation, so they want their ease in, ease out, or ease out, ease in, whatever that is in their mind. Uh, and then I looked at the duration of the animation, I did the math, and I realized there were three or four frames in the, the entire animation. And I tried to convince them that it didn't matter if we tried to accelerate or decelerate, because when you have three frames, like, there's no way you can see you know, the acceleration and the deceleration. So that's another reason for you sometimes to use linear interpolation. If the animation is really, really fast, you know, don't even bother. Uh, fortunately, we make it easier for uh, you to have nonlinear timing or any timing that you want. So I want to run a, a quick demo here and show how this might work. So let's escape out of here. All right, so we have linear interpolation. Um, w so somebody uh, talked to me at, I think, Google I.O., and he said, uh, so I have this animation that I want to run with, um, with text, uh, text element that I want to slide onto the screen. What's the best kind of interpolation that I should use? What is the, the correct thing? And there is no correct thing. The answer is always, unfortunately, well, it depends. It depends on your situation. It depends on the feel of your application. It depends on what you personally want or what your users would feel more natural in the context of your application. So I suggested that what he should actually do is to simply write a demo application and play with the different interpolators, play with the duration, play with the, the different timing curves that we have, and just come up with the one uh, that made sense for his context. Um, and then I realized uh, that maybe we should actually make that kind of thing available. Um, so yes, it's not actually that hard, especially to write a very limited demo. Uh, and I would suggest people do that in general. But in the meantime, I realized maybe we could provide the facility for you to do this yeah. in general. You'd think we would have that in Android Studio. You would think we would, yes. It would be a nice addition to the tool. Um, and that conversation has been had. Uh, in the meantime, we have a demo that I intend to publish. Uh, Yeet, what would it take me to push this to the GitHub thing? Like, uh, <laughs> Uh, the question was you or me. Uh, if I did it, okay, so ye could put just push this tomorrow and I may get to it by Christmas. Uh, all right, so we have here kind of what you would expect. Uh, so we've selected a linear interpolator. We're going to run the animation here. Um, and then you're going to see the, the animation move in a couple of different ways. It's going to move along the curve that we've drawn helpfully on the graph below. And then there's a couple of random elements at the bottom. So you can see what the motion is like moving left to right or uh, top to bottom. Um, so you can run that a couple of times. You can change the duration. So I want to make it you know, long enough that people can, the audience can see it on the screens. Uh, you can do repeating. So if you just kind of want to get a feel for it over time, you can have it run over and over. Uh, but let's look at more interesting curves here. So we can go to the decelerate curve. And you can see the timing representation on the curve here on the graph. Um, so you can run that and see that um, it starts out pretty fast and then it decelerates over time. Uh, the factor here is one of the um, parameters that you can use in the constructors. So we can change that, see the effect that it has on the timing curve, and then run the animation again and get a feel for that motion. Um, bounce is kind of cool. 
Uh, this is one that Roman wrote years ago. I don't know who actually uses it, but it looks really cool on the graph. I wrote it because we used it at some point. I, it's a little cartoony. You probably don't want to use this one in general, but just play with it because it's fun. Uh, and then, so we have um, path interpolator, which is a very general uh, thing that you can use. You can supply an arbitrary path and get all kinds of kooky behavior. Uh, but we also have a couple of uh, ways of creating uh, canonical quadratic and cubic paths. Um, so quadratic path has one control point, so you can change the curve by dragging the control point um, and get a feel for that timing. Uh, using this facility, the path facility in general, basically you can reproduce all the other ones that you want. So the path interpolator that we introduced in Lollipop was meant to be a more general purpose interpolator that you could probably get any kind of curve that you're looking for. Um, so very quickly, we'll go over to the cubic. And this one has a couple of inflection points, so you can get more complicated. Whoa, especially if you drag it to the wrong place. And again. There we go. And run that one. OK, so the code is not very interesting. All of these are really easy to create. They're basically different constructors for the interpolators. And then the interpolators just return the floating point value over time. Uh, the interesting part is actually being able to play with the demo. Um, most of the code is mostly there. I need to clean it up a bit. Um, so as I said, Christmas. Um, there's a toolkit demo or toolkit UI demos repository on GitHub. Um, I'll publish it on Twitter and G Plus and all the regular places when that goes up. Um, so look for that. All right, uh, Arc. Um, related to the time one before, we don't, we don't move uh, in a linear fashion in time, nor do we move in a linear fashion in space. Right, we don't generally follow a straight line everywhere. Especially um, when drunk. Especially, especially last night. Um, so instead we move uh, generally non-linearly. Wouldn't it be nice if our objects on the screen did the same? Again, to avoid the mechanical feel. So if you're moving an object from one corner of the screen to the other, it should follow probably some subtle path along the way. It just looks more organic and natural. So instead of following a straight line, we want to do something more like this. Again, a uh, quick demo. By the way, new emulator, oh, so sweet. <laughs> Give it up for the emulator. I love this thing. Uh, OK, so we can see three different kinds of motion here. So we've got linear motion. So we basically have the button moving from left uh, top to bottom right. Um, and we can move it either linearly or with path motion. And there's a couple of different ways to construct the path, path motion. These last two look remarkably similar, but the code for creating them is, uh, is very different. I wanted to show both ways of creating this. There's the one in the middle is using object animators, manually creating a path, and then uh, using object animator to animate along that path. And the last one is doing a transition. Um, so a little less code for doing pretty much the same thing. So that will be on the slides. OK, so um, the first step in doing any of these animations is you want to figure out where the button is now. Uh, so we're going to say, OK, get the, get the current position, the x and y. And then we're going to reposition the fuse. So we're going to change the layout parameters. Um, in this case, I'm using uh, the new constraint layout. So I'm setting the button to be either anchored to the left top or the bottom right. Uh, and then I set the layout parameters, which is going to cause um, a request layout. So we're going to come around later and do a layout. Um, and when that happens, we want to pre-draw a listener. This is a common animation technique. It's on a lot of stuff that we showed before. It's also at the heart of how transitions work. Um, so we grab the view tree observer. We add an, a pre-draw listener to it. And then in the pre-draw listener, we know that layout has happened. So now we can do the magic and figure out where it, it is at the end state and then animate from the beginning to the end. Uh, and by the way, I told Chet to use lambdas to make the slide look you know, a little nicer and easier to read. But he didn't know the syntax, so he didn't <laughs> use them. That's like a new language feature. Are you kidding? No. No, no, no. Sad, man. I'm, I'm waiting for it to actually be a real thing before I start using it. Uh, OK, so here we have the linear approach um, where we find out the new position. We figure out the delta, so the delta x and delta y, where did the button move to? Then we set up an object animator that's going to animate two properties in parallel. So we have property values holder that can animate x and another one that animates y. And then we set up the an object animator to do both of those in parallel. Uh, we start the animation and, uh, and everything happens. And it moves in a boring straight line down to the corner. What you really want to do is make that curved instead. So same stuff you saw before, except with that delta x and delta y, uh, we now create uh, uh, a path motion instead. Um, so we're going to create a path 
with that information and we're going to create it um, with a couple of control points. So we, we move to the upper top uh, and then we do a, a quadratic. Um, and that basically specifies the single control point uh, that's going to be used to create the curve in between them. Um, you can look up the, the uh, parameters for this later, but it's just a simple curve that says, I'm going to move from here down to there, and there's going to be a, a control point in the middle, but offset from that line, which is going to cause the curved motion. Start the animation, and it animates along the path, pretty much the way you want it to. Uh, okay, an easier way to do this is using transitions. Um, so, first of all, you don't even need the old position uh, because the transition is going to figure that out for you. So, step one is reposition the views, same way we did before. So, set the layout parameters appropriately, cause a request layout, uh, and then say begin delayed transition. De the transition manager is then going to set up that pre-draw listener on your behalf, figure out where things were, figure out where things are, and then run an animation. By default, it's going to be linear, but you can change that easily by using an arc motion. So in the change bounds transition that you're going to use, you can say, use an arc motion. It's going to automatically figure out for the path that it took an appropriate curve for it to, um, to follow. So the code on this slide is pretty much everything you need to run a, a curve transition instead. Secondary motion is an animation that helps call out uh, the overall motion of some other animation. So a simple diagram of this is we have this bouncing ball over to the left, and you'll notice the one on the right is doing something else that emphasizes the motion. So as soon as the one on the left hits the bottom, then there's a, a pulse um, and that just helps emphasize the overall feeling of what the animation is. Uh, we can see this in the UI. Um, so this is the same somewhat janky uh, screen record animation that we had before. Um, in particular, I want to call your attention to the play button that animates in. So you've uh, you've enlarged the album coming into the second activity, and then we animate in the play button and also the icon of the user over on the left. And it's these animations working in conjunction that show you you are now in this album and you have the option of uh, playing the album at the same time. So se secondary motion is a great technique, but uh, be careful. It's pretty easy to start using it all over the place. So Play Music does it right. They use it on only one element, but I've seen applications, and maybe we've been guilty of that uh, at Google, where so many items play secondary animations that it's actually overwhelming for the user. So try to focus it on one or two key elements of your UI. Don't sprinkle it around just because you know it's fun to add more animations. Which it is. Uh, actually, that, that's a good point in general is you will find if you're trying to use a lot of animations that things may get noisy on the screen as they overlap. Curved animation, um, besides making things more organic, can also be an effective way to make sure that items are not colliding or overlapping too much on the screen. All right, I want to show one more quick example. This is in the notification shade. If you pull down the notification shade, um, you'll notice in particular the gear icon at the type is a really nice uh, secondary animation that's happening. Right? So you can see as you're dragging it down, the gear icon will fade in and it'll turn at the time. So drawing your attention to this settings thing and emphasizing the sort of expanding nature of the notification panel that you're going into. There's lots of other secondary uh, motion things going in, secondary animations going on in here as well, but the, the gear icon is sort of the key one that I like there. Timing. Um, so timing is about, I mean, a lot of animation is about timing anyway. This specific principle is about um, using timing to convey a sense of um, reality, a sense of physicality to that object. So if we have a very small object um, that's moving a very short distance, it should move very quickly. It's a light object. You want to convey the sense that this is small and light and it's not really going anywhere very quickly. On the other hand, if you have an object that is moving a great distance, then it's appropriate for it to take longer because it's a physical object. It should take longer to get there. The duration on that second animation was much larger. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a much larger object and you want to convey a sense of that, um, animations should usually be as quick as possible. But if I want to convey that this sense really has, that this object really has weight to it, um, then the duration should help convey that. It should take longer to get there um, yeah. because large things take longer. And as you work on this kind of animations, you'll notice that uh, it's all about the visual perception. So it can be very interesting when you have large transitions. So if you fade in a full screen element, for instance, you might want to use sometimes a shorter duration because the object is so big visually that it will feel like the animation is taking longer than it actually takes. Um, and again, so, so if you implement something that big, you know, something as big as that circle in one of your applications, you start playing with the timings, you'll see what I'm talking about. Solid drawing. I, I, for this one, um, it's about, again, conveying a sense of physicality. 
Uh, I originally thought the, the principle was about, well, you have to have solid drawing skills. You need to actually be a good illustrator to do animation. That's not it at all. It's actually conveying a sense of solidity to your objects, a sense of physical reality to make sure that the users understand and, and empathize with the stuff going on on the screen as being real beings. Um, you can see this. Uh, here's an example from the material design spec, and you can see examples, obviously, in the UI as well, where this is part of the whole reason behind um, the shadows is the sense of reality that we wanted with the cards or the objects or these, these paper objects on the screen is that you give them elevation um, and they'll automatically then have a shadow associated with them that helps you understand the physical nature of them. Uh, I want to go really, really quickly through the rest of the rules which don't really apply as easily to UIs um, because otherwise we're not going to have time for uh, romance, completely unrelated stuff. Swash and stretch. Um, this is about, uh, again, sort of physical nature. As things fall, maybe they lengthen. You know, gravity is pulling on them. Really cool. Not terribly useful in UIs because it's a bit too cartoony. So, surprisingly, this is something that does happen in real life. Uh, if you've never seen a slow motion video of uh, a golf ball hitting a wall or a tennis ball hitting a wall, you should look that up on YouTube. And you'll see it's pretty impressive how much they squash and stretch as they hit a wall. Uh, we don't see it because it goes really, really fast in real life, but it actually happens. So if you have golf ball UIs, go for it. Uh, the next one is um, anticipation. Uh, this is the, something that helps. It's like staging. It's very related to staging, where you want to help the user understand what's happening on the screen. You have very few frames in which to do this, especially in, in old traditional animations. So if your character is going to run quickly from the right to the left, maybe it's one of those disappearing things where they just show the motion lines. It may be hard to understand that if they simply disappear and there's lines on the screen. But if the character first rears back slowly, then we know that this is an anticipation maneuver where they're going to then uh, run off in the opposite direction. Uh, again, very important for animation, not necessarily applicable to a lot of UI uh, stuff. Straight ahead and pose to pose. This is about the difference. It, it helps create a, a sense of frenetic energy in animations. Um, the traditional way of animating things is you have these keyframes. So they'll draw these major poses, and then some junior animator will come in and waste their time drawing all the stuff in between. Uh, what they can do instead to convey this sense of energy is draw every single frame individually, not as much the pose to pose, and then it just creates this, this extra energy uh, because of all the sort of noise going on between those. Again, not terribly related to UIs. Um, follow through and overlap. This is about physical objects again. Uh, if you hit a wall, um, your bones are going to stop immediately, but the flesh on your body, especially depending on how much flesh you have, is going to continue. That is right? gruesome. <laughs> uh, the golf ball is also a, a good example of this. Like some parts of that object may stop at that hard wall, but the parts that weren't constrained are going to continue. So that's the follow through that helps the user understand this is a real physical being. Again, kind of cartoony for UIs. Um, exaggeration. Uh, this is terribly useful in cartoons where part of the, uh, part of the idea is, is to have fun. You want it physical, but you also want it to be sort of surreal, more than real. Um, and again, really nice in cartoons, not necessarily something that we, we want in our UIs. And uh, appeal. Wouldn't it be nice if people actually uh, had empathy with your characters? You want to make them appealing, give them charisma. Uh, this is certainly true of your UIs. You want your UIs to be appealing not quite the same way that we apply that principle. I'm going to let Roman talk because I should shut up. All right. So now let's talk about colors. Um, so there are two reasons why I wanted to talk about this. Uh, first, it's my current obsession. I've been thinking about it a lot. Uh, and it's actually, and, and I'll mention that at the end of the talk, but I made one submission in the Android and code base, and it was about colors. Uh, so there's a problem that many apps, most applications get wrong, even some uh, very fancy applications like Photoshop on your desktop sometimes don't get it right. And I wanted to talk a bit about this uh, to help you, you know, fix your applications if it, if it uh, actually matters to you. I also wanted to talk about color spaces because we've seen uh, recently over the past couple of years the introduction of wide gamut displays. So we have the new specifications for uh, ultra HD TV, so 4K and 8K displays. They have really large color spaces. We're starting to talk about HDR. Apple has started shipping wide gamut displays with their IMAX. And chances are that in the next few years, we're going to see this kind of technology reach mobile phones 
and then you'll have to start to worry about color spaces. So it's going to be a gentle introduction to this incredibly complex uh, problem. Uh, and it, it really is an introduction, so if you can't remember everything at the end of the talk, don't worry about it. We'll publish the slides and you can use them as a reference. Uh, they're full of notes, there's presenter notes, uh, so that you can follow along at home. And there's a test tomorrow. <laughs> there's a test tomorrow. Actually, we'll start with you, Chet. Because uh. I gave you the talk yesterday. Uh. All right, so the first problem is the, the issue of gamma versus linear spaces. Uh, and just to be clear, um, I'm using terminology in this talk that's a gross simplification of the actual color science. So if there's a color scientist in the room, uh, you probably will be shocked and hate me for what I'm going to say, but I want to keep things th simple. So the key takeaway uh, of gamma versus linear is that you are doing it wrong in your application. <laughs> I did a bunch of hearts to make you feel better about it. And to understand why you're doing it wrong, we have to go back all the way to the early beginnings of computer science with CRT monitors. Uh, so it's been a while since uh, I'm sure uh, most of you have used a CRT monitor. Uh, and I think everybody knows, like, do you know how a CRT monitor works? Like, raise your hand. Okay, so either you're dead or you don't know. All right, so in the CRT monitors, there's an electron gun, which sounds really cool. Uh, it's actually pretty boring in practice. It just fires a bunch of electrons at the phosphorescent screen, and there's a mask that creates the RGB, uh, the RGB values. So I have a technical diagram that shows exactly what happens. Uh, so you know we have the electron gun, and here it's a light bulb because I couldn't find an emoji for electron gun. Uh, and it fires little, little things at the screen, and you have an image. Now, uh, to better understand exactly what happens in those CRT monitors, let's imagine we want to uh, display a gradient. So, this is the input uh, to our monitor. So the horizontal axis, that's the, uh, the, the pixel coordinates, and the vertical axis is the color. So effectively, this is a black to white gradient. So we're sending that curve to the monitor, and we say, please display my beautiful black to white gradient. Uh, you know, and the equation for that is x. What the monitor will actually do is display this curve. So this is what we call the gamma curve, and it's x raised to the power of 2.2. The side effect of that is that your beautiful black to white gradient is now darker than when you intended it to be. You know, you didn't do anything wrong, you wrote your app, you did the thing that makes sense, and yet it's going to look dark on screen. And uh, this happens because of the way electron guns work. Like, it's physics, we can't really change it. Uh, physics is annoying sometimes, uh, and that's one of the, uh, of the situations where it is. Uh, so what we have to do is correct for that gamma curve. So this is called gamma correction, and I'm sure you've heard about it. Uh, you've probably seen it in the UI of your, of your operating system. So all you have to do is apply the inverse curve to your input. So here it's x raised to the power of 1 divided by 2.2. So our blue line is now the green line. And if we send that green line to the monitor, it's going to apply the, the orange gamma curve, and the output will be our linear gradient, the thing we wanted in the first place. Things are a little more complicated in practice. The gamma of CRT monitors is actually closer to 2.5. Uh, the reason we use 2.2 is because um, in, in common lighting conditions, so you know, you're in your office, you have lights, and you have, you have lamps, and you have the window, uh, it decreases the perceived contrast of your monitor. Uh, so we correct for that by using the wrong gamma curve. But you can forget about this. Uh, is everybody lost yet? <laughs> Get in there? All right. Hey, I tried to make pretty slides so that you would you know, want 2. to follow 2. along. Just remember 2.2. 2. 2. I don't know what it stood for, but 2.2. Uh, and of course, you know, we don't really use CRT monitors uh, nowadays, and uh, we kind of stopped using them for mobile phones a long time ago. So there's a big question. <laughs> when we have an LCD screen, do we still need to worry about camera correction? And I'm sure you can guess the answer. And the answer is yes, and the reason is because of our eyes. Uh, and side note, uh, when you want to take a picture like this of someone's eye, make sure they really like you, because it's pretty painful for them to keep their eye open for several minutes with like a really bright light shined in their eyeballs. What you can't see in the picture is the clamps that held the eyelid open yeah. for five minutes. So I'd like to thank my wife who cried for like 10 minutes afterwards because her eye was tired. So it turns out that the uh, response uh, of our eyes when you know, there's light coming into our eyes is also nonlinear. Uh, our visual system follows a mathematical law called the Stevens power law. See how many things I'm teaching you today? Uh, and this law applies to many, many things. It's actually very simple. Here's the equation. So, no, this is a simple equation, you'll see. So we have a stimulus uh, called I here. Uh, and in, the, in, in our case, uh, I is the light. It's the brightness of the light that enters your eye. 
And the subjective magnitude of sensation, so the brightness you actually perceive inside your brain, is a function of the, uh, of the stimulus raised to a power. And in the Stevens power law, that power is noted gamma. And that's why we talk about gamma curves. I, I, I just want to point out that if you want to appear smart in a presentation, use Greek letters. That looks really smart, that equation. Yeah, the that's problem is that I, I've been doing a lot of math over the past 12 months, and I always forget like, the name of the letters. <laughs> that's squiggle. I think the one on the left is psi, psi, however you say it in English. Um, so the, the gamma value, that value, uh, depends on the type of stimulus. Uh, for light hitting the eye under, uh, under uh, common lighting condition happens to be 0 0.5. And here I've done a bit of uh, what I call graphics math. Uh, so 0 0.5 is pretty much equals to 1 divided by 2.2. It's actually 1 divided by 2, but you know, in graphics it doesn't matter. If it's almost true, it is true. <laughs> so through uh, a mix of sheer luck and a bit of engineering, it turns out that our CRT monitors have exactly the inverse response curve of our eyes, which make you know, things work really well for everybody. Now, if we go back to our LCD displays, they do not have a gamma response curve. Uh, they, some of them are more linear, some of them have a more S shape. So what we do instead is we have hardware in our LCD monitors that make them have that gamma response curve. And you might be wondering, like, why do we bother? So one of the reasons was for compatibility with existing CRT monitors. It's nice to not have to rewrite all the applications just because someone inv in invented a new type of display. But the real reason we keep doing that is that gamma encoding, so we talked about gamma correction. Um, so today it's not about correction anymore. It's about compression. The gamma curve is actually a compression scheme for images. Um, so you know about JPEG, you know about the way the PNG works, you can zip your images. But turns out we also use gamma uh, to compress our images. And the reason for that is, if we go back to that uh, curve from our eyes, what that curve shows is that our eyes are more sensitive to the dark, uh, to the dark tones and the mid grays than the highlights. Which means that if we encode our images linearly, so if you just have your values from 0 to 1 without doing anything specific, you just write your for loop, we are going to waste a lot of precisions in our, in our bits uh, to encode the, the, the value. So here I have an example. Uh, it might be difficult to see on, on the projected screen, but I quantized a black to white gradient over five bits. So we only have 32 values to encode the gradient. And you can see that if in a, with a linear encoding scheme, we spend a lot of our bits to encode the highlights where our eyes are not very sensitive. So it turns out that if we were to encode our images with that scheme, which seems to be like the, diff the, the standard way of doing it, the way we should be doing it, we would need about 12 bits per color channel to encode an image. And you know, if, you, if, you've looked at, if you've used image processing tools before, if you're, or if you've used bitmaps in the past, you may have noticed that we never use 12 bits, we use 8 bits. And the reason we can use 8 bits is because we do apply the gamma compression scheme. So when you encode an image with a gamma curve, you're effectively redistributing the precision of the bits in the dark tones, so then we can encode all everything the eye can see over only eight bits. And that's why it's a, a compression scheme. So uh, compressing with gamma is actually not necessary. If you have high precision formats, uh, they, they can encode in linear space uh, if they are precise enough. So some of the formats that are now commonly used, especially in the movie industry or the gaming industry in the production pipelines. So there's OpenEXR, it's used to encode HDR images. There's a PNG 16 bits that you can use. Photoshop lets you store in 16 and 32 bits. And if you have a camera and your camera can uh, take raw images, then the raw file will effectively be uh, stored in linear over 16 bits per channel. So what, what that all means is that when you have a photo uh, like this one, the, 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 the colors you see on the screen are not the colors the way they are stored on your hard drive. This is what's stored on your hard drive. So this is the same photo, just encoded with that gamma curve, which makes it brighter. So that way we, we have more precision in the darks. Again, you will never see the, the picture like that, but this is actually how it's stored. This is how cameras create the JPEGs. So the only reason your pictures are so nice is because the hardware compensates for it. <laughs> Pretty much. Okay. Thank you, Chet. Yeah. Um, now, color pickers in application, those are an interesting use case because you are picking a color by looking at the screen. You know, you have this nice color wheel and you say, yeah, I want to, to, to pick that nice red. You are seeing the color picker through the gamma curve of the display. So effectively, you are choosing a color that has been gamma encoded or gamma compressed. 
So unfortunately, some of the color pickers actually get that wrong. Uh, I won't go into much details, but uh, I noticed that some th the, the, the Mac OS X color picker uh, is not doing it correctly when you choose a grayscale value uh, using that little slider that you see at the bottom. But for all intents and purposes, you can assume that any color that you pick in your, in your Photoshop, in your sketch, in whatever application you're using has been gamma encoded and is not a linear color. It also means that every, every time you write a color value in your application, be it in your code or in your XML resource files, it's a gamma encoded value. And that is important because um, you are not in a linear space. So if you're going to do math on those values, let's say you want to compute the average of two colors, the result is going to be wrong because you are not in a linear space. You're, in, you're on that gamma curve. So we're going to look at, a, at an example with graphics. So let's imagine we have the linear curve. We have uh, the, you know, a black color, so it's, uh, the value is 0. We have a white color, the value is 1. And let's imagine we want to find the average. So what is the value that's halfway between 0 and 1? It's obviously 0 0.5. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, that is wrong, because if you do output uh, that 0 0.5 value to the display, remember that the display is going to uh, apply its own gamma curve. And so the value you're actually going to get is going to be 0 0.2, which is much, much darker than that mid-gray mid between 0 and 1. So those two values, black and white, actually live on the green curve. So before you do any processing on them, you must uh, compensate for that green curve. And we're going to take a look at a code example so you see how to do it. So here's another example, and that's actually the, the, the thing I fixed in, uh, in N. So here we have a bunch of gradients. So you could imagine there are gradients that your app is actually generating. You're creating a bitmaps, and you just have a simple for loop, and you're, you're interpolating colors. Or it could be uh, interpolations over time. Let's say you're animating from red to green. And if you look at those gradients, you know, they look pretty nice. But towards the middle, the colors get darker. So we start, for instance, the top one. We have this bright red. We have this bright green. And yet, to, so, some, at some point in the middle, we become dark. And that doesn't make any sense, because between bright red and bright green, we should see only bright values. And the reason is uh, we're doing linear math in the wrong space. So if we compensate for that, these are the gradients you actually see. And I think the, the bottom two are, are, are very telling. They look a lot nicer when you do the math correctly. You can see now in the middle, between red and blue, we go through a purple, a bright purple, and not a dark one anymore, and something between green and blue. So the takeaway, and that's the, 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 the most important slide in that entire presentation, is do all your math in linear space. And doing that is actually fairly easy. So here's a piece of code. Uh, we have a couple of colors. Uh, usually on Android, they're stored as ints. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to extract the red channel of, the, of both colors. So there's a bit of, uh, of shifting and masking. We want to move to a float value between 0 and 1. So, so far, it's pretty easy. And now uh, we have our R1 variable. And all we have to do is apply the gamma curve. So remember that that color is encoded, is gamma compressed. So it's on that big green curve. So we just need to apply the 2.2 gamma curve to bring it back in linear space. We do that for the second color. Then we can do our linear math. So here we're just finding the average of the two colors. And when we have our result, we just re-gamma encode it back to that green curve. And that's all you have to do. Uh, again, I'll publish the slides so you can, uh, you, 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 you can uh, refer to them if you want to do that in your applications. So anywhere in your applications where you do math on colors, do it this way. The results are going to be much nicer. Uh, one very important, important point, uh, do not gamma decode the alpha channel. Alpha is supposed to be linear. Uh, unfortunately, Photoshop does that wrong by default, uh, and gamma encodes the alpha channel. So you want to make sure that if you work with, uh, with, with UX, if you have designers, tell them to go in the color settings of Photoshop. And there's a color setting for gray. And by default, it's set to dot 20%. Tell them to choose as gray. And that's going to fix everything. If you do 3D, if you do OpenGL, uh, OpenGL has a lot of extensions to do that automatically. There's dedicated hardware in the GPUs to do it for you. So uh, just do it if you're doing OpenGL, because it's going to be free. You don't even have to write anything in your shaders. Uh, it's just a matter of setting up your textures correctly. And what's important is to remember that this, uh, this issue affects everything. So we saw gradients, we saw color interpolation. But that also means that if you do a blur, or if you downscale an image, or if you upscale it, downscaling an image is effectively doing the average of every pixel with its neighbors. And if you do that in the wrong space, you are making the image darker. 
animations, we just saw an example. 3D lighting, if you're doing OpenGL and you're doing lighting, you should also do it in linear space, otherwise you're gonna have U shifts and the colors are going to look wrong. Uh, if you ever wanna know if the applications you're using are doing things correctly, uh, you, can, you can use this pattern. So it's a series of stripes, they're black and white, uh, and the middle at the top, we have gray, uh, the value is 128 over 255, and the bottom is 187. So 128 is the, is the average between black and white in gamma, sp in, uh, gamma space, and uh, the bottom one, 187, is the average of, um, of black and white in linear space. So if you put that image in Photoshop or Chrome or whatever app you wanna try, if you downscale the image to 50% to, to 50 of its size, the, uh, the black and white stripes should become the color of the bottom square. If they turn into the top square, then that means the application is doing it wrong. So we saw the gamma curves and they're fairly easy to implement, but things are actually more complicated than that. Uh, and the big question is, what is a color? So we're, we all think in terms of RGB and we've seen RGB everywhere in our code. Uh, red is, you know, 255.00, right? Uh, so there's a definition for users. I'm gonna skip that real quick. And the definition for developers is that a color is actually a tuple of numbers inside the color model and they're associated with a color space. So RGB is a color model and the tuple of number is the three values that used to define R, G, and B. CMYK, that's often used for printing, uh, is also a color model. It has four values in the tuple. So we're gonna forget about everything but RGB. So we're just gonna focus on RGB. And the big question is, if I tell you that uh, I have an RGB value of you know, 100 or full red, what kind of red are we talking about? And it's an important question because if you look at the visible spectrum that we can per perceive with our eyes and our brains, this is what it looks like. Um, and color science is interesting. The way we came up with this spectrum is in the 1920s, a bunch of scientists uh, took uh, random people, as far as I, I know, and asked them to look at colors and asked them like, if they could differentiate between the colors. And after asking enough people, they decided that this is what we can see. So the problem is that we don't have display, we don't have hardware that, uh, that can record or even display the entire visible spectrum. And that's why like saying that you have a red of 100 is kind of meaningless unless you know what slice of the visible spectrum we are talking about. And that's what color spaces are about. So here you can see um, on the screen, uh, there's a few triangles overlaid on top of the visible spectrum, and those are fairly common color spaces. You might have seen them before or heard about them. So there's sRGB. Uh, this is typically your, your laptop monitor or your desktop monitor. Uh, we have Adobe RGB and Prophoto RGB that are commonly used by uh, high-end cameras or image processing applications like Adobe Lightroom. And those are much wider than, than sRGB. And you can see in here that the red, so if you look at the right side of the diagram, the red value for sRGB is not gonna be in the same spot as the red value for the Prophoto RGB. So it's not gonna be the same red as seen by your eyes. So what defines the color spaces? We have three primaries, a white point, and what interests us the most, conversion functions. So if we go back to that slide, the primaries define the, uh, the, the vertices of those triangles, it's simply the red, green, and blue, their location in the visible spectrum. The white point uh, simply defines the neutral color and you've probably seen that with displays. You, know, you might have seen displays that feel bluish or yellowish, and it's because the white point is different than what you're used to. Uh, and just to teach you even more stuff that you don't care about, <laughs> uh, color spaces are actually not in 2D, they exist in 3D. So those classes that you see here are the footprint of a color space at the minimum brightness. But if we vary the brightness over the uh, a third axis, you see that that's what the color space looks like. So this is the sRGB color space. Uh, and it's interesting to see it in 3D because I mentioned earlier that our eyes are more sensitive to the dark tones. And you can see that in the 3D shapes, we have more data in the dark tones and less in the, the highlights. All right, so those conversion functions, what are they? They are the equivalent of the gamma functions that we saw earlier. So remember the 2.2 uh, exponent and the one divided by 2.2? Unfortunately, uh, they are more, a little more complicated than that in, in, in practice. And they have really, complex names. So instead of talking about gamma curves, we talk about the optoelectronic conversion function, or the OECF, uh, and that one is the equivalent of raising uh, the, of a gamma curve when we raise to the power of one divided by 2.2. So it's to convert from the linear space to the gamma uh, compressed space. And the inverse function is called the electro-optical conversion function, or EOCF. 
So every color space must have those two functions defined. So now the big question is, which color space should you be using? And the only one you can assume, especially on Android and on mobile phones, is sRGB. This is how every application on your desktop works by default, unless you do something else. This is how, basically, the web works. Uh, you know, they're trying to fix it because we're starting to see what gamma displays, like I mentioned before. So, but unless you know what you're doing, unless you know otherwise, always assume that the colors you are using are in the sRGB space. So now if you remember those gamma 2.2 uh, curves we saw, we've seen before, this is the real equation uh, for the sRGB space. Uh, it's a piecewise function. There's a small linear step at the beginning. So it's the x multiplied by 12.92. And that one is important because um, if you want the highest quality possible for your conversions, remember that I said that our eyes are very sensitive in the dark tones. And this is why we have that linear function at the beginning in the very, very, very dark tones. Yeah, but you, you talked for a long time, yes, so I did. I'll, I'll go over yes, time. I did. Uh, and the second part of the function that looks complicated, so you know it's like 1 plus 0 0.055 multiplied by x, uh, x raised to the power minus something, that actually is, can be approximated with a 2.2 uh, power expression. And this is the inverse function. Uh, they're easy to find online. You, know, you can find them on Wikipedia. You don't have to, uh, to write them down. But it's the exact inverse function. This is the a possible Java implementation for, uh, for the OECF function. So instead of rising to the power of 1 divided by 2.2, uh, you have to write uh, an if statement, basically. Uh, it can be pretty, I mean, the hardware that we have today is very, very efficient, but that can be pretty slow if you're going to process a really large image uh, or if you just want things to go fast. So there are various ways you can optimize this conversion. Uh, the first one is to use lookup tables. You can pre-compute, you know, like you have sRGB 8-bit, so you have 256 values. You can pre-compute a table uh, that, that applies the gamma function. When you want to decode, you have to use a, a 16, bit of, 16 bits of precision because we are in this gamma encoded space. Or you can start applying graphics math that I mentioned before. So that big complicated function can be approximated with the 2.2 power that we saw earlier. Or if you want to go even further and optimize even more, you know, Two point, like x to the power of 2.2 is almost x square, so you can just use x square instead uh, and use the square root. So don't hesitate, like when you're doing, whenever you're doing image processing, uh, if, if the result looks good, don't worry about doing funky math, that's fine. Uh, so this is a comparison uh, between the, the, the different approximations of the uh, conversion function for, for sRGB. The correct one is, is the blue one. Uh, it's almost the same as the 2.2 uh, gamma curve. If we were to zoom in at the very beginning around the, the, the origin of the axis, we would see there's a, a bigger difference because of the, the linear uh, part of the function in sRGB. And you can see that the, the square root approximation is pretty far off, but still going to look fairly good on your screen. Now, to make things even more complicated, uh, if you write apps for Android TV, uh, Android TVs work, a little di like TVs work a little differently. They don't use sRGB. They use something uh, called Rec 709 for HD TV. So uh, for 720p and 1080p content, the standard is Rec 709. So Rec 709 uses the same primaries and white point as sRGB. So the colors will actually be the same. The only difference is the conversion functions. They're also you know, fairly complicated but an approximation is a gamma curve of 2.4. So if you do write applications for Android TV and you are doing any kind of image processing or you're interpolating colors, you might want to go the extra mile and use a slightly different gamma curve for your, for your computations to make your, your, your colors look even nicer on TVs. Uh, Ultra HD TV, so uh, 4K displays and 8K displays use a, another color space called Rec 2020. And this one, um, as this, a similar conversion functions as the Rec 709, so uh, it's fairly easy for you to do, but the color space is very different. So here's a, a comparison between the color spaces. So here on screen you see sRGB and Rec 709. The only difference is the gamma, the gamma curve, so that's why one of them looks rotated compared to the other one. And uh, that giant triangle here is the Rec 2020, so it's a really, really large space. Uh, and that means you would need to do more than just applying a gamma curve to use it properly. And it's actually really lar so large that the uh, Mathematica, the application I used to generate that diagram, just went bonkers in the bottom right. <laughs> and there's that, that, yeah, it's a bug. Uh, it shouldn't be there. That was Mathematica saying, math is hard. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Mathematica is incredibly buggy. Anyway, so uh, something important is that uh, the Rec 2020 color space, all the colors are inside the visible spectrum. Um, 
All right, so I said earlier that you are doing it wrong. The good news is that Android is doing it wrong <laughs> everywhere, all over the place. Uh, we have, I could give you excuses, you know, like we started with really bad devices and they, didn't, they, have, they had very uh, shitty CPUs and we couldn't afford to do all those con conversions. So where, do we doing, where are we doing it wrong? Uh, gradients, they're wrong on Android. Animations, we fix them in end so they're less wrong than they used to be. Resizing bitmaps, are, it's wrong. Blending is wrong. Anti-aliasing is wrong. And everywhere else. <laughs> So that's one of my pet peeves, and I hope that someday uh, I, will, I will be able to like, go you know, all over the code and fix, uh, fix all the, uh, the blending equations that we have in the bitmap resizing and make them look better. Um, and actually, I did prototype that a, a couple of years ago. I hacked Android to see the difference, like what would happen if we were to do it right. And text, text anti-aliasing actually looks a lot nicer. Uh, it makes a huge difference. Once you've seen it, that's why I'm not showing it to you. I don't want to make you feel bad about your, your phone, but once you see it, it yeah, you don't want to go back. I'm almost done. <laughs> Last slide. So let's recap. Uh, what should you do? You have an input color. Assume it's SR sRGB. Apply uh, the uh, inverse conversion function. So gamma, uh, so x raised to the power of 2.2. You end up with a linear input. Then you can do your math. And when you're done with your math, you, go, you, you gamma encode, you compress again in the gamma space, and you can send that to the display, and everything looks nice. So basically, that was. Those were 50 slides, complicated slides, to just tell you something that's fairly simple in the end. And we don't have time for questions. We'd love to take questions, but we are so far over time that they're yelling at us from the back of the room through little sheets hey, of paper. They started late. <laughs> so um, I think it was all obvious anyway, so hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, uh, thank you.